Life in the neighborhood is interesting. We try to remain positive, and keep our yards up and stuff. I mean, there's a lot of crime around here, but I mean, it's home. What do you do? Oh, it was a great place to grow up. We had great schools. Um, it was a General Motors town, you know. My dad worked for General Motors. This is a working class neighborhood. Well, I've been here probably the last 11 years. Um, I live with my 89 year old grandfather. We gave up our apartment to come take care of him because they were gonna put him in an assisted living. So uh, we, we didn't want that, so we came and stayed with them, and we've been here ever since. There was little stores almost on every corner in the neighborhood. There was, um, you know, a store at the end of Bell, a store at the end of Jane. There was stores down on Lewis, on Leith. Uh, there were stores all through the neighborhood, and we had teen clubs. We had the Golden Glove Boxing up on Franklin. We just had a lot to do as kids. Uh, the norm is hookers walking up and down the street, uh, watching drug deals go on beside us. We're in between them. I have kids that are here that are growing up with the same visions that we see. We, they unfortunately have to see it, but we teach them what's right and what's wrong. My name is Megan Hazer, so I was born in Dunbar, Wisconsin, to a family of five siblings. Um, I went to a private school in Davison when I was five and went to Davison High School. My family was very close-knit for a long time when I was younger. My dad used to sit us at a table every night and ask us two questions. Um, one, what was one thing we learned from the day? And the other was, what was our favorite part of the day? Um, I think that my parents instilled in me this this quality of loving other people. And I can remember there's times where my dad donated money to get somebody a new washer when we really didn't have that much. And just watching that grow, growing up was very humble. And I think that I, I took away a lot more from that. When I left home, I got put into this position of just not having anything and having to find a way. And um, through that, I got involved in some things that were shaky, so involved with, um, people who were manipulative and people who took advantage of everyone around them and I got involved with a guy who dealt drugs and is actually now in prison. I did leave home relatively young and from there I kind of bounced around. I've lived with my grandpa, um, lived with a lady named Toya, Mrs. Tabor, Tanya, everyone down the line and from that I, uh, I think I, I lost a sense of self-worth being being in Flint and seeing all the vacant properties and, and being in survival mode and just always feeling lost. Uh, a lady that took me in and the one that asked me a very important question, so she was a four-time felon and couldn't find a job and in turn was a stripper and a lot of times people view her as a person who doesn't respect herself or a disenfranchised human, but this lady brought the most value to my life in the time that I needed it. And I kind of learned through that experience and through meeting people that, that your labels and your social status or anything like that doesn't matter. It's, it's irrelevant in the scheme of things. And I have developed this great appreciation for human beings for who they are. Porch like this represents a broken community. Um, not just for a vacant property, like I said, there's a lot of porches that are still in this condition with people living inside. This, this is an example of why there aren't neighbors talking to neighbors. If, if you can't even access your front porch, feel comfortable sitting there, you don't have something to look at outside of your front porch, the social connection is, is already broken. So I moved into, onto the east side of Flint in 2016 and I realized that after some time that my porch needed some work, so I power washed it, I dug up my flower bed, I trimmed my tree. Um, it was like a six week process that I did and completely renovated my front yard. But through this, I was able to talk to my neighbors. But the whole thing of that is like, 
through that one experience of activating my front yard, I was able to meet my neighbors and build relationships with them. And I kind of got this idea that if it could work for me on a small scale, it could work for people across the board. Like there's a lady who always read it on her porch in the, in the, the morning every day and she used to have really nice flowers but she was um, older now and couldn't maintain it on her own so we were able to do that for her. Um, or the neighbor who was like, I love the flowers across the street but I can't afford them. And it was just, it was a common problem across the east side where we started our project. So I kind of bundled it all together and we came up with our primary goal of using those beautification efforts to to hear their voices and to, to hear concerns beyond that. I was sitting on my porch and I seen her walking with Izzy and they come over here and ask would I be interested in planting some flowers, a flower bed, and I'm like, sure. I liked the idea, I thought it was a great idea. Like you don't see that kind of stuff in your neighborhood. We're used to a whole different view and to have somebody just approaching people that she doesn't even know is, is amazing. She actually is doing how it used to be, the, the flowers and stuff. The old people had flowers everywhere. That it, it kind of reminds me of that when I was younger. People get to choose everything from flower colors to mulch to the color we paint their porch to whether they want steps, everything in between because I'm not coming home to that home. When you drive home and you, you right up to your house and your porch looks nice or your flower bed looks nice, you get that, that sense of ownership, that sense of, uh, like, I'm supposed to be here. I really appreciate everything they did. I mean, they gave me rose bushes, they let me have a say in it, but they bought everything. Her project's been great uh, as far as bringing people together. Uh, she met us who then met neighbors across the street, neighbors next to us, um, and then even the neighbors down the street. From us, from her planting our flower beds, they went and planted their own flower beds. It was like the domino effect, honestly. Like, once one did it, everybody did it. Oh, everybody comments on, you guys have beautiful flowers, and now my porch is painted. And yeah, just it's a good feeling and people notice it. Everybody walking by, well, you sure have pretty flowers. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> um, there's people who can't access their front porch. There's people who want flowers, but they can't afford them. And, and um, that was just a city, a, a complaint that I heard through this outreach. So the Porsche project was kind of born out of that, my personal experience. Well, I've lived through the water crisis and I've dealt with five knocks a day on my door um, asking if I need a service and the problem with that is they a lot of times interrupted my life. So I started to close my curtains and lock my door and I wouldn't answer when people came. So I wanted to make sure that through the project we weren't chasing people away. We weren't making sure that they were silenced. So authentic outreach is what I call it and we adopted this policy of not knocking on doors. So I just walk six days a week three to five hours a day. The thing that was most profound to me and most humbling is that as I engage neighbors, I realize there's already so much connection. Like social, uh, people talking isn't um, an issue. Neighbors are relying on each other. There's, there's definitely a disconnect block to block, but citywide people rely on neighbors and friends and people they've lived next to. We have a, a 90 year old neighbor who, he's a hard worker, very independent old man and he had a fall on the sidewalk this past summer and it's taken a lot from him. He hasn't been able to do a lot. So, so we've paid it forward. We help him because it's something that makes him feel good to even be up and be able to go outside and see. So we even helped dig up his flower bed, plant his flowers how he wants them. We cut his grass for him. Um, my kids will even catch him coming home from the grocery store. and help him carry his groceries in. There was garbage, um, there was like drywall um, paneling. We found a little dead dog in a crate over here. They just dumped garbage, just garbage. And it was all overgrown, so it was down in the grass and the trees. And 
Like, I love this. I love the green, the open, the homeowners being right here. Since people brought up that as a concern, we actually went and started cleaning the vacant properties with them and making impacts in their neighborhood where they voiced them. So we get this project and we allow these options. So on the back end, we wanted to, to find a way to continually get it funded and research was a way to do that. My name is Rebecca Tonietto. I'm an assistant professor here at University of Michigan Flint. Um, I've been here for three years and I was thrilled to be able to move back to Michigan and continue doing some of my pollinator conservation work. So for the past 10 or 15 years, I've been studying a lot of our native bees in North America, which are extremely diverse. Uh, we have about 4,000 species in North America. Michigan has around 400 of them and I've sort of dedicated the research interests of my lab to determining how we can best support them in cities. So Megan and I met at a Tim Hortons. Um, it was right after New Year's, I wanna say 2018. Mm -hmm. And I'd been asked to join a meeting with some community members. They were building um, a, a, like a pollinator garden and some former open lands and had reimagined a space were interested in some plant recommendations. And Megan was one of the people at the meeting and sort of introduced herself that, oh yeah, I'm Megan, I'm, I'm also doing this thing called the Porch Project. Like, well, well, tell me all of it. Yeah, and so Megan started talking about it and mentioned how she had fixed up her front yard a little bit, um, sort of changed some plants and fixed up her porch and it got neighbors out talking more. She was trying to find funding sources to do that for other folks who were on the block or in the neighborhood who weren't able to do it themselves. And I thought it sounded like an amazing project and asked if Megan had any funding for landscaping. She talked about needing um, a habitat for her bees and I needed a flower bed. So we had intersecting needs, but we both wanted to be working in cities and areas where there's a lot of people. So we had aligning goals. So going forward with our partnership, it just came so naturally because we both had similar interests and, and similar goals. I truly believe this project, the Porch Project, is a win-win-win in a way that it's like Megan uses the term grassroots a lot for me, it's community led. So it's the neighborhood deciding this is what they want these spaces on this block to look like with a purposeful decision and buy in. And we're part of the planning process. It's a win from my personal perspective in that I'm able to continue like conducting the project, but also I'm bringing my students and building more meaningful relationships with the community from our university, the University of Michigan Flint. So just when we incorporated research, we wanted to make sure that we were allowing for the research to get quality data, but also having quality impact. It means like family, it should be like family, you know, having each other's back, watching out for one another, and like watching the neighbor kids when they're there playing, just to know that that's how it should be. That's how it used to be. Neighbors were like family. I always say it's, over-serving and understudying, and, and the sad part is a lot of times in cities, especially in Flint, they're over-studying and underserving. It's It's huge. I honestly, I wouldn't be able to do it without Megan. Like, coming from an institution and going into a neighborhood, like, you need to have trust, like, for people to allow me to not only come on their property, but to do it repeatedly and for years, and maybe if they're not home and to do all these changes and just to trust me that digging up what had been there before is okay and it'll look good. Like, I don't even know how many years of relationship building, like our, our partnership is invaluable in that sense and that it made it easy for me to walk into the community and through Megan, they trusted me. So for me, a porch like this, when I see it, it, it actually, discourages me because there's not just this one, there's a thousand more and it's a continual problem. And um, being able to impact that and give people the opportunity to not only look at something better outside, but also have a better porch and a better community space. If you look, I always say, the work I do in the community is to return neighborhoods to grandma's neighborhood, where you could go next door and ask for a cup of sugar. That's, that's the thing about these porches is that in the 1950s, 1940s, you had people, that was their main way of communication. And now that we don't have those today, 
it makes it impossible or puts a detriment on the connections that people could be making.